How does a guy with 21,000 flight hours, an airline transport pilot, crash a brand new twin engine airplane that was literally designed to keep flying after one engine quits? And worse, why did his passenger, also a friend, end up dead in a swamp that morning? The real reason isn't just an engine failure. No, the real reason is buried in the airplane's design, the pilot's assumptions, and in the brutal physics that don't care how good your resume looks. So here's the setup. The pilot was Daniel Mesnard, 67 years old from Florida, a serious aviator, airline transport certificate, instructor, even military time. Sitting beside him that morning was Timothy Pfizer, 69, from Ohio, just along for the ride. And the airplane? Not your typical Cessna. This was the Velocity V-Twin, an experimental, home-built twin-engine design that had been shown off at Oshkosh. Six seats, sleek canard layout, two UL power turbocharged engines with full FADEC. It promised a cruise speed north of 180 knots, a kit plane that could hang with high-end certified twins. They had just stopped at Kaolin Field in Sandersville, Georgia to check valve clearances and adjust the right prop. Maintenance finished, everything looked good. They lined up, pushed the throttles forward, and lifted off. Up to about 500 feet, everything was normal. Then, bang, the right engine failed hard. That's the pilot's own words. The airplane snapped into a right roll, and Mesnard fought like hell to stop it. At one point, he even tried what he called a low yo-yo maneuver. Now, for those not familiar, this comes from fighter pilot tactics. It's a quick drop of the nose, followed by a pull-up, basically trading altitude for energy. In his case, Mesnard dropped the nose sharply to pick up speed and regain control authority, then tried to level it out. It worked for a moment, the airplane stopped rolling, but it's the kind of desperate move you make when you're fighting physics at the edge of control. But the situation was already spiraling. Too low to turn back, he throttled back and pitched for 85 knots, his own test-determined single-engine climb speed. The airplane just wouldn't hold altitude. Seconds later, it plowed into a swamp. Mesnard lived, barely. Timothy did not. And that's where the story normally ends. Engine failed, airplane couldn't climb. But here's the thing. That explanation is way too simple, because the V-Twin should have been able to survive one engine quitting. So, what really happened? The wreckage told the real story. The engine itself hadn't just failed, it was silenced by a design flaw. When investigators dug into the swamp-soaked remains, they found the problem wasn't in the cylinders, wasn't in the turbo, wasn't even in the ignition, it was the wiring. See, running through the fuselage was a bundle of wires connecting the engine control units to the cockpit breakers. And right next to that bundle? The landing gear actuator piston, a moving part with metal arms that shifted every time the gear cycled. Now, in a certified airplane, you'd expect wiring near moving parts to be shielded, protected, separated, not here. These wires were unshielded, clamped right alongside the gear track. Over time, every gear cycle rubbed, chafed, cut. Until finally, on that takeoff roll, both of the right ECU's injector wires were sliced clean through. That engine didn't fail. It was cut off. But that wasn't the killer blow just yet. What made the situation truly lethal was the propeller system. The Velocity's prop controller automatically drove the blades toward fine pitch to keep RPM up. That works when the engine's running, but with no combustion, the propeller just windmilled at full drag. Instead of a clean feathered disc, Mesnard had a giant spinning air brake bolted to the right side. So picture it. The left engine is pushing, the right side is dragging like crazy. That's why the airplane rolled so violently, and why it refused to climb even at the correct speed. On paper, the V-Twin should have handled it. In reality, this wiring flaw set up a scenario no amount of raw experience could instantly overcome. Now here's where things get really crazy. Daniel Mesnard wasn't just some guy with a private pilot license. He was a 67-year-old airline transport pilot, an instructor, even with military flying on his record, over 21,000 hours in the logbook. That's the kind of experience that makes most of us think, if anyone can handle an engine out in a twin, it's him. But here's the real problem. He only had about 50 hours in this Velocity V-Twin, and that difference is massive, because the V-Twin wasn't a Boeing or a Beechcraft Baron. It was a freshly built, 
one-of-a-kind home-built airplane with its own quirks. And during phase one testing, Mesnard made one decision that looked small, but turned out to be a huge blind spot. He never actually shut down an engine in the air. He never feathered a propeller. He thought it was too risky. So instead, he just simulated engine failures by pulling one throttle to idle, with the prop still spinning at cruise pitch. And that's where the illusion comes in. His testing gave him numbers. VYs, best single engine rate of climb speed, around 85 knots, and VMC, minimum controllable airspeed, around 68 knots. On paper, those looked solid. In his flight tests, pulling one engine back to idle, the airplane could indeed maintain control and even hold altitude. But the problem is, that wasn't reality. In reality, a completely dead engine with a prop windmilling in fine pitch creates drag that's orders of magnitude worse. It's like saying you tested driving your car with one wheel off the gas, but never tried it with the brake fully stuck down. The numbers you get from that kind of fake test don't mean anything when the real failure happens. So when the right engine actually quit and the prop refused to feather, his carefully written test book instantly became worthless. And that's why this case drives home one of the hardest truths in aviation. Experience doesn't equal proficiency if you've never trained for the exact scenario you end up facing. Let's dig into the aerodynamics, because this is the part that most people overlook. When a twin loses one engine, it's tempting to think, well, you've still got the other engine, so you've got 50% power left. But the reality is brutal. Losing one engine can wipe out 80 to 90% of your climb performance. That's because the good engine's thrust isn't perfectly aligned with the center line. It's offset, and that creates yaw, roll, and drag that the rudder has to fight constantly. Now, add the worst possible scenario, a dead engine with its prop stuck in fine pitch. Instead of feathering out and cutting drag, that propeller is like a giant paddle wheel in the wind, spinning freely but sucking energy out of the airplane. Imagine trying to pedal a bike while dragging a parachute behind you. That's the kind of drag we're talking about. Mesnard did what he thought was right. He pitched for 85 knots, the VYs he had determined in his tests. But the problem wasn't his airspeed. The problem was physics. At just 500 feet above the ground, he had no altitude to trade for extra speed, no room to experiment with feathering, and no margin to recover from the roll-yaw couple caused by that windmilling prop. And here's the cruel truth. It didn't matter that he was an airline captain. It didn't matter that he had 21,000 hours. Physics doesn't care who you are. If you're flying a twin at low altitude with one engine dragging in fine pitch, your options shrink to nothing in seconds. And this is where we need to step back and look at the bigger picture. Because the crash of November 106, Victor Tango wasn't just the story of one pilot's training gap, it was also the story of experimental aviation's double-edged sword. The Velocity V-Twin was a showstopper at Oshkosh, a home-built twin that could cruise at 185 knots, carry six seats, and look like something out of the future. People loved it. But in the world of experimentals, innovation comes with risk. The builder's choices become the safety margin. And in this airplane, one of those choices was devastating. The wiring for the engine controls was run unshielded, right next to the moving landing gear actuator. Every time that gear cycled, the actuator could rub the wires. Eventually, it cut right through them. That would never pass in a certified design. In a certified twin, wires near moving parts must be shielded, separated, protected by clamps and guards. But in a home built, the FAA doesn't design it, the manufacturer doesn't design it, the builder does. And that's why this crash wasn't just a mechanical failure, it was a design oversight baked into the airplane from day one. And here's another uncomfortable truth. The guidance available to builders and pilots for experimental twins is shockingly thin. The EAA flight test manual, the FAA's own advisory circular 9089C, they talk about single engine testing in theory, but they don't give detailed procedures for how to actually shut down, feather, and document performance in a multi-engine experimental. So builders like Mesnard are left to figure it out themselves. And in this case, he figured it out wrong. So what's the price of that freedom to innovate? Some would say it's tragedies like this. And the question we need to ask is, should experimental twins face stricter oversight, or do we accept that risk is the price of progress in this part of aviation? 
At the end of all this technical talk, it comes back to people. Timothy Pfizer, a 69-year-old passenger from Ohio, lost his life. His friend, Daniel Mesnard, survived, but with injuries and a burden he'll never forget. And that's the legacy of November 106 Victor Tango. It's not just about wiring diagrams or aerodynamic charts. It's a reminder that in aviation, the tiniest oversights, a chafed wire, a skipped test, a misunderstood speed, can cascade into tragedy. It's a reminder that even the most seasoned pilots are vulnerable when the airplane throws them something they've never truly faced before. So let me leave you with this. Do you think this crash was inevitable, given the design and training gaps, or could it have been prevented with stricter rules, better testing, and tougher oversight? Let me know in the comments, because if there's one thing aviation teaches us, it's that the only way to honor the lives lost is to make damn sure we learn from them.